Today on CityCast DC, one of the most notable features of Washington's cityscape is the skyscrapers. There aren't any. That is thanks to a law that's more than a century old. But we are now in the midst of another conversation about maybe tinkering with this law. Should we? WTOP's Luke Garrett is here, and he is going to break it down. Today is Thursday, August 10th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. Mayor Bowser has proposed this huge revitalization of downtown post-COVID. This revitalization could include nixing DC's famous slash infamous height act. Why is that? Yeah, so come back DC. You know, this is the plan that the mayor has unveiled to really revitalize the downtown. And it's risking a rollback of the DC Height Act because she wants more residential living spaces in DC's downtown. You know, we've all been downtown, it's full of offices, and those offices just aren't full. You know, at the start of 2023, Castle Systems, which does key cards for companies, reported that only 46% of those offices downtown in D.C. are full. And that's kind of stayed true up until now, halfway through 2023, and it's down to 44%. So those offices just aren't filling up. And it's creating kind of a money crisis for the city because a lot of tax revenue comes from, you know, people occupying buildings. So this Comeback D.C. plan includes Mayor Bowser's hope to fill these offices with residential areas. And the D.C. Hyde Act comes into play because, you know, she wants more residential areas and to get to those levels she wants to be at, she might have to, you know, build higher. And it's nuanced because she might not be building higher to build more like actual apartment complexes. Developers might need to put in AC units. She might need to put in, you know, decks on roofs. And so they just want some more, you know, building space. And the D.C. Hyde Act right now is keeping them from doing that. All right, let's back up for a second. What even is this Height Act and <laughs> yeah. why does it exist? Right. So turn back the clocks to 1910. The Cairo building uh, was built in the DuPont Circle neighborhood. And it was a huge hotel, the biggest and tallest building of its time, and really marked kind of industrial revolution and this new possibilities for building heights. The residents at the time hated it. They thought it kind of craned over them and they wanted to limit it. And a lot of cities around the country were doing this. So they instilled a, you know, height act that kept buildings residentially to 90 feet and then on commercial blocks to 130 feet. And it stayed in place. There's been a couple alterations throughout, you know, the years, the past century. But what it's done is it's created the horizontal skyline, you know, many D.C. residents love and revere. Um, even tourists love it. You know, they always mention it, talking about that low profile, really made right. it stand out uh, among Chicago, you know, New York City. And so the D.C. Height Act has stayed strong. There have been a couple of revisions over the years. In 2014, there was one, but it's really stood the past century. So it, the myth was that you no know, buildings are allowed to be higher than the Capitol. That's not quite true, but the effect is the same. And it leaves D.C. with maybe with a, with a very unique in the country uh, cityscape skyline. Yes. Yeah. You know, the Washington Post took a poll in 2014 when the D.C. Height Act kind of was on the political chopping block, if you will. And overwhelmingly, D.C. residents really did not support rolling back the D.C. Height Act because they were scared of, you know, skyscrapers. And to be clear, the mayor is not proposing, you know, skyscrapers in D.C. It's really about 30 feet, 40 feet. And I talked to a city planner in the mayor's office, Uwe Brandes, and, you know, he says people wouldn't even notice the changes. So that's kind of I think creating a newer kind of conversation, more nuanced conversation. All right. So break down the politics for me here. Who yeah. is in favor of getting rid of the Hyde Act and who's against it? Right. So, so far on the D.C. Council, at large council member Anita Bonds, Ward 1 council member Brianna Doe, Zachary Parker and Vincent Gray, those council members are kind of for rolling back the D.C. Hyde Act. And they're all kind of have different stances on it. Anita Bonds is like, look, like we need affordable housing. Zachary Parker is kind of in the same camp there. Brandon Doe thinks the D.C. Height Act is kind of a distraction. She thinks zoning is actually more important, but she's still in favor of rolling it back to give developers some more breathing room. 
So leaving aside the individual council members, can, what are the constituencies who favor getting rid of the Hyde Act? I mean, I would assume business developers, et cetera. Right. So developers definitely are in favor of rolling the D.C. Hyde Act back because it will let them develop further. It will give them some more room. I mean, this is a heavy regulation that really kind of bars them from building up higher than 130 feet in these uh, commercial areas. On the other side of the issue is Phil Mendelson, you know, chairman of the D.C. Council. And I was talking to him a few weeks back and he said he would throw himself across the dais and scream, you know, if the council were to ever roll back the D.C. Hyde Act. He thinks it's one of the most important parts of this city's architecture and layout. So so what are, and what constituencies is he representing with that position? So I would assume preservationists as a, a big voice in D.C. Yes, preservationists. And he said, you know, the broad majority of the D.C. public, you know, people move here for certain reasons. And he thinks that many people live, many people move here because of its, you know, human scale, its human size. They choose not to go to the suburbs. They choose to stay here uh, for, you know, just the beauty of the city. And so he thinks he's kind of representing the majority of D.C. residents' wishes in, you know, fighting any sort of alterations to the D.C. Hyde Act. Mike, a little birdie told me that somebody recently had a birthday. It is true. Although I thought you were going to say uh, John Riggins and Barack Obama, both of whom share my birthday. Oh, uh, uh, oh, 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 oh. that's a uh, good list of people to share birthdays with. So you, Barack Obama, and CityCast DC all have similar, if not the same, birthdays. Right. So, and we are celebrating uh, the CityCast anniversary, doing something live on August 28th. We are both going to be there for a live anniversary taping and party. I can't wait. It's all happening at Sunny's Pizza in Parkview. It's going to be an anniversary party and live taping. It starts at 5 p.m. and there's going to be a natural wine tasting by PlantWise. Monday night, taping starts at 6.30 and it'll kind of be a, a nice fall foliage looking event. We're going to be talking about DC's fall fairs. So getting us ready for the cooler fall weather, which y'all know is my favorite season. And we will be joined by Chelsea Ceruzzo, formerly of Axios, now my political colleague. I can't wait. I'm excited to get to hang with you and celebrate both your birthday, CityCast DC's birthday, Barack Obama's birthday, all in one spot. So we tend to talk about this in really absolute terms. Like it's either going to be you can build any height of building anywhere you want, or it's going to be completely the status quo. Could it be altered in some areas, not others? East of the river, you could have taller buildings or along you know, the, where the wharf is. I'm throwing out hypotheticals. But is that sort of in the cards right now, or are we talking about a citywide change? So as the law stands now, it is, you know, over the entire district. Now, if they change it, they could probably change it in any way they want as long as it gets through the council. And then you also have to include the whole other political calculation of Congress, because Congress will also, you know, have its two cents here. But I think, you know, it could look like most likely an increase of around 30 feet, three stories across the board. That seems to be the simplest proposed rollback of the DC Hyde Act so far. And, and that's- Why three stories? Why not 10 stories or, or eight stories or 20 stories? You know, that's a good question. When I was talking to Uwe Brandes, who again is that city planner in the administration, he was saying basically that people do value the height of the low height of buildings in DC. People do value that horizontal skyline. People do want to maintain that. And so some sort of middle ground could be that 30 foot height increase. But, you know, it's true. Public opinion changes. And I think we're at a very key moment here, much like we were back in 1910 when we could build all these tall buildings and the city had to make a decision. The city has to make a decision now because people are not coming back to work in DC's downtown, at least not yet. And it looks like not for a while. So there could be some big swings in public opinion on the D.C. Hyde Act. Um, and that's affordable housing reasons. That's for development reasons and revitalization reasons. So they're saying, like, look, it's not going to look like Manhattan all of a sudden. It's not going to look like Roslyn all of a sudden. Right. It's not just take our word for it. It's like literally we're not even going to give people the ability to do that because we're only talking about 30 feet, et cetera. I'm confused, though, about the housing component of this, that the mayor says this is because she wants to entice more people downtown because in a post office work era, a city's tax base depends on its uh, on residents much more than on uh, people commuting to office jobs. Is there evidence that what 
people want and what would entice them to move into D.C. is living in tall buildings. Because, you know, my sense of Washington is there obviously are plenty of people living in apartments, but the sort of for people who have a choice tend to want houses. Is there any evidence that like if you put up like a 17 story luxury building somewhere that that actually is going to be a thing that helps increase the amount of housing available? To my knowledge, you know, no. I think the simple calculation is you create more housing. It helps with the demand issue that's really jacking up prices across, you know, the city. So I think that's the simple kind of thought process. As far as, you know, hard data on whether or not this will work, I haven't seen that myself. And I think it makes me think of what Mendelssohn also told me, Chairman Mendelssohn, which is redeveloping these offices into residential areas. That's going to take five years minimum. And a lot of people want to solve this revitalization of downtown now. They want to bring people back soon and bringing residential areas, bringing residential buildings, I should say, to downtown. That's going to take a long, long time. And it's a very big, long game. Some people think it's worth it. Some people think it's not. I think that sort of behind all this is this sort of question about what it is people in Washington want. You said there was a poll. People really like the Height Act as it is. There are, in some neighborhoods, kind of pitched battles between people who cast themselves as yimbies. They want things in their backyard and people who they call nimbies. Right. <clears throat> the nimbies probably, I mean, maybe I'm showing my bias by, the, by that, <laughs> even by that nomenclature, but the, the, those people obviously see it differently. And they're trying to preserve a certain scale and stuff. But what is your sense or the political figures you're talking to, what is their sense of whether the general public to whom they answer are more NIMBY, more YIMBY, where are they on, on these kinds of issues? Yeah, so as far as the D.C. Council, because I reached out to every single council member to get where they fall, Mendelssohn doesn't want D.C. High Act to change. Four of the council members say they had supported change. The rest are still not giving a stance, and that's them saying, Luke, I had, don't have a stance. So I think there's a lot of waiting and seeing. I think we're at a critical moment where there is a bigger reason than there ever has been to roll back the D.C. Height Act. And I think local politicians are waiting to see if, you know, public opinion will change with this new reality we're facing, which, again, is downtown in need of revitalization. I haven't seen an official poll, you know, yet. The Washington Post did one again in 2014. So I've done cursory polls on Twitter. You know, I've done kind of man on the street interviews. And from that alone, it still seems kind of like a 70, 30 percent in favor of maintaining D.C. Hyde Act. I mean, look at like we've got plenty of commercial corridors away from downtown. But if you think of just sort of around your red line stations or your green line stations where there's a lot of like two and three story buildings and there has apparently been no appetite or no ability over the years to turn all those into like six story buildings or eights or whatever is legal under the Hyde Act. So if they're not building to capacity as it is now, what makes people think that anyone would actually build anything, even if you raise the Hyde Act to infinity? Right. And that's another point that both Mendelssohn and Nadeau brought up. So zoning is where we need to put most of our efforts and time if we really want to create more affordable housing in the city. Builders aren't building past the zoning. And if the zoning kind of eases up and lets people build more, you know, those middle housing developments, then that maybe solve the solution. And it's not building these huge residential areas. There also used to be an aesthetic argument about the Hyde Act against it, which is that because you can't go tall, you have to like maximize the amount of square footage you put within the short height. Right. And therefore, uh, people are building boxier, uglier buildings and with less like whimsy than they than if they could go higher. Is that a thing people have been talking about this time? Anita Bonds said that pretty directly when I reached out to her. You know, she said there are beautiful cities like New York and Chicago whose aesthetic is benefited by, you know, being able to build higher. So that's she, why she said, you know, I would support rollback of the D.C. Hyde Act like right now, as long as it was like, you know, a rational kind of rollback. She's kind of ready to go. So is this time different? This is a, a thing like like urbanism nerds like me have argued about it, talked about it, argued for it over the years, but it's never really changed. Does anybody think this time's different? The reason I think this time is different is we just had the pandemic. You know, we never have gone through that in the modern era. And when I reached out to all the council members, I was surprised that Mendelssohn was the only one, the only council member that said, we are not going to change the D.C. Hyde Act. Everyone else either said they're really in favor of changing it, rolling it back, or they're not ready to make a stance, even though 
you know, the latest polls from 2014 say public opinion supports kind of Mendelssohn's position. That to me was like, okay, I think people are looking around, uh, seeing if this DC comeback plan the mayor has proposed will maybe push public opinion to rolling back the DC Height Act. That's why I think it's notable. Luke, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Before you go, here is some quick news. Trayon White, who represents Ward 8 in the D.C. Council, wants to call in the National Guard to assist D.C. police. Mayor Bowser's administration appears less than enthusiastic about this. Her deputy mayor for public safety says the city is focused instead on attracting and retaining actual cops. The D.C. Police Union, meanwhile, blames the D.C. Council's police reforms for staff shortages. Also, D.C.'s attorney general has released new guidelines to increase transparency around restaurant service fees. Restaurants have to make clear if the money goes towards base wages or is distributed on top of wages in the manner of a tip. They also have to display fees more prominently on menus. And finally, Metro is skipping important trainings and certifying rail operators without all of the required testing. That's according to a new report from the Washington Metro Rail Safety Commission. The regulatory agency flagged similar concerns last year that led to some key resignations. The situation could delay Metro's planned return to automatic train operations this year. And that is all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, shout it from the tallest building you can find and subscribe to our morning newsletter here at dc.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye. In reporting on the story, I sat in the lobby of the Cairo building for about two hours until some very nice person let me up to the rooftop to see D.C. atop the Cairo Hotel, which really sits at the center of this story in the D.C. Hyde Act. And it was just a beautiful view of all the places you could go to see what the D.C. Hyde Act has created atop the Cairo building is a beautiful sight. So if you get, ever get a chance to, um, you know, meet someone who lives there or beg the person at the front desk to let you up to the roof, it's a good look. Oh, you must be convincing. <laughs> I wouldn't let you on my roof deck. Yeah, I know. I said of my two-story house. <laughs>